Are you tired of being overcharged and forced into paying a monthly subscription for your Mac and Windows software? Well, if you are, currently we're having a 50% off discount on all the latest Mac and Windows software, such as AutoCAD, SolidWorks, Photoshop, Microsoft Office, and much more. Our 50% off discount will be ending soon, so be sure to text us, ready to buy, to the number on the screen. Starting pricing for low-end software $100 and starting pricing for high-end software $500. We aim to please, so expect 24-7 technical support, the latest premium software, instant software links delivered to your email, and PayPal buyer's protection guarantee. Attention all hip-hop heads and rappers. Experience the thrill of a lifetime at the Bar for Bar Rap Contest and Comedy Show. The Rap Contest is hosted by the Hidden History Museum August 12th at 7 p.m. sharp. Show off your lyrics and battle it out for a chance to win 500 bucks. Then get ready to laugh with the hottest comics. Don't miss the night of fun and entertainment. Visit HiddenHistoryMuseum.com. That's HiddenHistoryMuseum.com, where history meets hip-hop. Boom, there it is. All right, how y'all living, man? How are you guys living? How's the family? How y'all living? How y'all living, man? We are in here. Let me make sure my audio is good. How's the audio, guys? Let me make sure the audio is sounding the way it needs to sound. What's up with y'all, man? I had a fun it. Oh, I'm turn my volume. How's my audio, guys? I'm, I'm in here. I'm in New York right now. And I'm out here chilling, ladies and gentlemen. Hope my reception is going to stay good because sometimes at these hotels, I get the janky reception. Boy, we got a, well, a lot of people in here already. How y'all living, man? We here. Glad to have everybody tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. Um, letting everybody know that we're live right now. And I am broadcasting in New York. The audio is cool. Let me let me take a quick listen. Hold on. Chilling, ladies and gentlemen. Hope my reset. Yeah, I'm good. All right. Still in New York City, man. I am in New York City still. Shout out to everybody here in the beautiful New York City. I absolutely love New York when I come here, man. New York is such a vibe, such a wonderful vibe here in New York. Everybody's so cool. The energy is very great and phenomenal. Um, just a, I, I really like New York, man. And it's really a, a nice change of scenery to be around a lot of brothers and sisters, you know, um, from normal walks of life. Out in LA, you don't get around too many normal people, everyday people doing everyday things. Out in LA, you know, people always got some other stuff going on that's not really normal. And no disrespect to LA, I'm just saying. Um, lovely people out here. You meet people out here, hey man, I work at the hotel over here. You meet somebody, hey man, I work over here at Starbucks. You know, you meet somebody here, hey man, I, I work for the city. You know, in L.A., it's like, hey, I just got signed to a modeling contract. You know, it's that type of thing. Hey, I just got a production company. You, you, you dig? So, I like that energy of um, New York. You have um, normal working class people who are, who are cool. You know, that's a good vibe. And you just don't see that too much, you know, out in L.A. Much love to L.A. Shout out to New Jersey in the house. All my New Jerseyites. A lot of stuff we're going to get into tonight. So you'll never live there again. Yes, yeah, a lot of stuff going on. It's a lot of stuff going on. But I love New York, man. And you, let me tell you something. New York, man, The y'all got some beautiful sisters out here, man. New York women are very slept on. You got some very lovely sisters out here. Not as fine as my wife. Let's get that shit straight. But there are some very lovely sisters out here. Very lovely sisters. A lot of y'all are in shape, I see, because y'all do a lot of walking. There's a lot of walking going on out here. So a lot of y'all are pretty much in shape. A lot of sisters are very natural. They look good naturally. Um, just going around Manhattan, you don't see too much made up. You know, everybody ain't overly made up. Yeah. Everybody's not overly made up. You said, because I live in the Valley, but dude, I'm in L.A. I'm in central L.A. every damn day at the museum. Yeah, you know? but um, <clears throat> sisters look very good. Very good look, yeah. Very good looking sisters naturally. 
They got a lot of naturally good looking sisters out here. You know, and that's, you know, that's something different. You know, L.A., everybody's dolled up. You know, people be getting dolled up to go to the laundromat in L.A. In, in L.A., they don't, you know, you don't see too much non-makeup wearers out there. You got to get a whole full lace front on and full makeup and eyelashes just to go to Target. You know, girls out here are just washing wear. They, they wash that face, pull the hair back, and go do their thing, and they still look good with it. Shout out to those sisters here. They look very, very good. Um, even the, hell, some of the crazy homeless dudes, even some of them got them, themselves together. I was um, walking in Manhattan, and unfortunately, we do have a lot of mentally ill people. We have a lot of homeless brothers and sisters out here, you know. The homeless folks in, in New York are very entertaining, very entertaining, but I saw one dude was walking down the street. I was walking, I, I got the nails done. I had to get a little manicure out here. I was down there, um, I don't know where I was, somewhere here in Manhattan. Went to, I was going to a nail spot to get the little manicure popping. And it was a crazy brother. I hate to say crazy, but he was kind of crazy. He was walking down the sidewalk looking like some, you know, some from the Thriller video. His eyes was bugging and was kind of rambling and talking to himself, which you see a lot of. You see a lot of that, people kind of talking to themselves. And sometimes out here, and, and on a side note, a lot of people out here, you don't know whether they're crazy or not. <laughs> they can kind of look normal. Uh, there was a sister who was standing on the corner. I was waiting on my, my, my car, and there was a sister standing there talking. But yeah, you know that right, and I'm thinking she has a Bluetooth on talking to somebody. Yeah, hell yeah. She almost looked like a businesswoman. She's like, oh, hell yeah, you, you, that's right. I'm going to get mine every every dime, every percentage of mine I'm going to get. I'm like, who's she going? She's handling business on the phone. Then she turned around, wasn't no Bluetooth in her ear. Like, she was just talking to her imaginary friend about some money. Like, oh, shit. Okay. But I saw the brother. He was he had, like, tattered clothes. And, yeah, they walking down the street, brother... <laughs> I mean, really looking like something from the Thriller video. Just really... I mean, really walking down the street. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Like that. And the thing, what stood out with this brother, he's all twerking and tweaking down the street. But this nigga had a fresh fade. I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. And I looked at it, he passed me by. I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of, okay, this nigga don't, you know, he's twerking and tweaking. I hope you don't twerk and tweak on me, but I'm looking, I'm like, wait a minute. This nigga got a fresh freaking fade. Hold on. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. He out here tweaking on the streets, but he sat his ass down to get that fade, though. You had to sit still to get that fade. That didn't make any sense to me. He made... He made sure to stand still and stop tweaking long enough to get that fresh fucking lineup he had. Like it's, even the homeless crazy people gonna stay fresh. New York niggas will stay fresh if it will, if it's the last thing they're gonna do. A New York nigga is gonna stay fresh. This thing had a fresh fade. I'm like, are you homeless and crazy with a fresh ass fade? Man, come on, dude. Really, my G. <laughs> Probably from a halfway house. I don't know, man. Uh, but dude, I, I talked about this on my um, my live the other day. Um, dude, what, what my New York people? What happened to all the the delis and stuff in Manhattan? I remember, man, in Manhattan, and I've been to some nice restaurants. They got some very nice restaurants out here, but in Manhattan. You could go down, to just walk downstairs and just go to any block and there's like a deli, one of the mom and pop delis. And you hear this cops, you know, you hear all that. But you would, you would see these mom and pop delis all over Manhattan. And they were popping. I like going to those delis because they had a nice variety of different food. You know, it was kind of a mom and pop thing. Food was good. I don't see none of them no more, man. I don't see none of that no more down here. Everything is corporatized. Everything. And the, 
I, I, when I go to a city, I like to, you know, get the local stuff. You know, what's popping? Let's say COVID. COVID shut a lot of them down. Okay. I see a lot of them did get gentrified. A lot of them turned into weed spots. I noticed that there's a lot of weed spots out here. I noticed there's a lot of weed spots, but I really, really miss those, um, those little corner delis. That was one of my favorite things to do to come to New York. And I, I don't see none of those out here no more, man. Um, and, and the problem is because we don't have those corner delis out here no more. You have, you have you got a lot of trucks now. Now you, yeah, I've been to, yes, I did go to Dallas Barbecue. I went, I went there twice. I went there yesterday and I went there today for lunch. I love Dallas Barbecue. Dallas Barbecue was popping. I like that spot. Yeah. Okay, who's this? 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 Oh, this is Sarnetta. Hold on. Okay. Sarnetta, I got to hit you up when I'm done. That's Sarnetta. Sarnetta, I'll hit you up when I'm done. I should have hooked up with you today, Sarnetta, but we'll talk. We'll talk, Sarnetta. Go past 110th Street. Um, I want to go to Melba's. I keep hearing about Melba's. Where are my New York people? How's Melba's? I've been to um, Amy Ruth's. That's good. I've been there, you know, when I come here, I go there. I want to try the Melba's spot. Um, probably Negril. I want to go back to Negril. But, but what we see now here, because you don't have all those corner delis like they used to have, they, um, there's a lot of these food trucks or these food stands, right? You have a lot of these food stands out here now, and uh, I had a bad experience. <laughs> when I got here yesterday, I just got in town yesterday. Um, I'm starving. I'm like, let me go I, Let me go downstairs and grab some meat. I'm looking for one of these delis, so I'm walking around. I can't find one of the delis. So I see all these food trucks. I said, all right, let me try one of these food trucks. And, you know, they got the little foreign, what is this guy look like? He could have been Russian or Croatian. I don't know where he's from. And I'm like, um, all, they got hot dogs and gyros and falafels. They got fish, all these weird dishes. And it's some Eastern European guy cooking it. I'm, okay. Now, I remember at, at one point in New York, back in the day, the little street vendors, some of their little food is popping. Yeah, back in the day, the little dude on the cart, they'll make you a hot dog and it would be popping. Not no more. Not no more, dude. What happened? I was like, I walked up to the truck. I said, hey, um, you have chicken or turkey hot dogs? Yes. Okay. Give me a, give me a turkey hot dog. Okay. And the way he said it, I'm like, he kind of said it like he was bullshitting. Yeah. He, the way he said it, I'm like, and he put, he put a real strange looking hot dog on the grill. It was real thin and it was, the, the color was kind of off. I'm like, I said, is that, a, is that a turkey hot dog? Yes, it's turkey. He's looking like that. I said, all right, all right. Okay, all right. So he makes this turkey dog. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It, 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 it looked real funny, man. This is, it, all right, maybe, I'm like, this is what New York hot dogs look like. I don't know. So I, I'm eating this nasty shit. And I, I took one bite, I almost vomited, dude. Like, what the fuck is this? Dude, it tastes like what you could imagine a pigeon would taste like. It was clearly not turkey. That's one thing I know for sure. What I ate was nowhere near goddamn turkey. I've been eating turkey all my life. That wasn't no turkey at all. To this, I swear to God, I don't know what this nigga gave me. I don't know what this dude gave me, dude. It, it, this was horrible. I almost vomited on the streets. I'm pretty sure I ate somebody's gerbil or something. I never tasted anything so damn nasty. I couldn't figure out what type of taste that was. I don't know what the dude gave me. At all. But nigga, 
my left knee been hurting ever since I ate it. My left knee is feeling funny. I don't know what that shit was, but it got my knee hurting. <laughs> Dude, I don't know what the hell that was. So you come to New York, avoid these dudes with these trucks, with all of these. If you come here, if you see gyro hot dog fish and chips, go, go somewhere else. I'm telling you, that's not no regular damn meat, what these niggas are selling on the streets here in New York. I don't know what it is. That ain't no regular damn meat. Yeah, there's plenty. Just take your time. I was because I was going to go to there was a um, Joe's Pizza. I was going to go there, but there was a long line. So I'm like, damn, I don't feel like waiting in no line, and I don't know where the delis are. So let me get the the little jive ass truck, and that didn't turn out. <laughs> so I need a cleanse. Uh, where are the herbal shops in New York uh, or Harlem or the Bronx? Where are the the herbal shops that the brothers own? Where are the herbal shops so I can get some of those drinks and bitters and all of that stuff? <clears throat> all my New York folks, where are the, the good herbal shops out here? I ain't talking about the corporate stuff. I'm talking about the mom and pop joints. I need a good cleanse. I need to get some of that pigeon meat up out of me. Yeah, I need to get that pigeon meat up out of me. No, I don't get a cleanse when I go home. Damn that, I want a cleanse now. Yeah, Joe's um, Pizza, there was a line around the corner. That shit was packed. Yeah, that was packed. Yeah. But I love New York. You know what I saw was funny? I went to um, the CVS Pharmacy um, here in Manhattan to grab some water. Had to grab my, you know, when I'm going to stack up on my waters. And why the, the some sisters in there working. Y'all know this is the most New York shit up. The sisters were in there cursing out the customers. <laughs> And it was completely normal. The sisters were in the CVS working there, and they kept cursing the customers out. <laughs> I swear they were, dude. I'm like, I'm so not used to seeing that. And everybody was just kind of not even tripping. You had these hardcore New York women working in CVS, and CVS is a pharmacy. So you go in there. <laughs> Yeah, you, you go into, you know, a, a drugstore, a pharmacy, you know, you expect, you know, out in L.A., the CVS pharmacy, everybody's all cordial. Hi, sir, you, would you like to pick up your prescription? Um, would you like to put your phone number in, sir, to get some added discounts? Sir, if you get one water, you get another water free. They're real cordial at CVS in L.A. Where I'm from, they're very cordial. Dude, the, they were curse, literally cursing people. I swear they were cursing people out. I'm standing in line and, and it was a dude waiting in the system. Come the fuck on! She was yelling at the dude in front of me to come on because he didn't go up there. She, did, she, did she just curse this dude out? It was a white man. He, he scattered up up there. This, this, is a, this is an employee. And then another dude on the other line, he got something. He got something out the back or something. And she was like, if you ain't going to pay for it, put that shit back. <laughs> what kind of CVS is this? They were cursing people out at CVS, cutting up left and right. I'm like, nobody's tripping. These sisters were cursing people the hell out. Yo, put them fucking Skittles down, son. <laughs> like, oh, Lord. Jesus. And I'm giving them my, I, I go up to pay for my stuff. Anyway. You got a discount card? I said, no, I got a phone number. That number ain't it. <laughs> oh, okay, let me put in another number. <laughs> that ain't it, son. All right, let me put in another number. Oh, there, you go. there it is. You want a bag? Yes, can I get a bag, please? All right. <laughs> Those women are very aggressive out here. Thank you. Come back. We'll see you soon. Right, they, they run this shit like a trap house. These are women. Damn, y'all, some hard ass women out here. All right. The New York women are very interesting. Some of the New York women are very, very interesting. 
Oh, I don't even want to go to the trains. I don't want to go to I don't want to go underground. <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine. How many folks we got in here? Listen. <clears throat> oh, we got a lot of folks in here. But listen, family, listen. Now, family, I've been promising you guys, and that's tying into today's broadcast. That's tying into today's broadcast. We're talking about hoodoo. What is hoodoo? We've been talking, we've been kind of touching on that for the last few weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, that's tying into what we got. The deodorant product we have is available now. We got a deodorant brand, and the name of the brand is called Root Work. All right? That's our deodorant brand. We have a deodorant brand called Root Work. That's the deodorant brand. And right now we have the Root Work package. We got um, two different scents to choose from. We have the, and this is all natural deodorant. This is um, the coconut butter scent and the vanilla, pure vanilla scent. Root Work deodorant. All natural. And we got a package going on, man. In this package, you get this, you get the root work, hand towel, you get a book. We have a book, ladies and gentlemen, that goes with the package. The book is called Mysteries of the Root. It gives you an introductory to what root work is. The root work package is at rootworkstyle.com. In the root work package, ladies and gentlemen, this is all natural deodorant. Somebody said for Musty Mondays. Yes, because some people are very musty. Um, in the Root Work package, you're going to get the Root Work deodorant. You're going to get the Root Work um, face towel. You're going to get the Mysteries of the Root book. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to get an American Maroon DVD, Blu-ray rather, and you're going to get a buck breaking DVD. You're going to get all of that stuff in the introductory package just for 59 bucks. This is a promotional package to introduce the product. It's for men and women. It is unisex. It is unisex, ladies and gentlemen, and it smells very good. It smells very good, and we have something in there. It's all natural, and we have something in there called High John the Conqueror Root which is something that was very popular. It is unisex. Let me show you guys the website. It is a unisex product, ladies and gentlemen. It is unisex. This is the website. It's absolutely unisex. Let me show you the website, Root Work Style. What am I doing here? What am I doing here? What am I doing? Oh, RootWorkStyle.com, ladies and gentlemen. Let me show you all the website. Everybody, oops, what am I doing here? What am I doing? What am I doing? All right. What am I doing here? Come on, thing. All right, this is the website, Root Work. And we explain what Root Work is, ladies and gentlemen. We explain what it is. Hold on, let me make it. Hold on one second. Let me get this thing. Lower it. All right, that's the Root Work website. And we'll scroll down on the Root Work website. And this smells very, very good, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very, very good scent. Extremely good scent. We scroll down and explains what Root Work is. It's unisex for men and women. It's a deodorant where heritage meets natural wellness. All Our all-natural deodorant draws inspiration from the profound culture of foundational black American Root Work, a revered tradition that flourished for centuries in the southern United States. And you can read that. And there's this book right here that comes with it, Mysteries of the Root, ladies and gentlemen. This is a brief book that gives you an introduction to what root work and hoodoo is and how that ties in, because that's something that's not talked about in our culture. All right, you can get that, the introductory package, the bottle of root work, deodorant, a copy of the book, the hand towel, American maroon, and bug breaking, all of that, 59 bucks, great deal. And it's for men and women, ladies and gentlemen. It is for men and women. See, family, we have to start, and this is very important, we have to start gatekeeping our culture. We have to start gatekeeping our culture. Somebody said, be careful with hoodoo. Now, see, let me, let me tell you something. Hoodoo, for the, a lot of folks, don't even know the real deal about hoodoo. 
a lot of folks don't know the real deal about hoodoo. Hoodoo, they think hoodoo and voodoo are the same thing. They are similar, but they are different. All right? Voodoo and hoodoo, they're similar, but it's different. No, Jackie, you're going to get a whole bunch of other stuff. Hell, the, the DVDs, it's the, the two DVDs, that's like damn 60 bucks alone. Then a book, then the deal ring. Come on, that's a great deal. That's a phenomenal deal. But listen, a lot of folks don't know the truth about hoodoo and voodoo. Hoodoo is a primarily foundational black American tradition. All right? There are some things that were drawn from Africa centuries ago. A lot of things were cultivated here. There were some things taken from the black aboriginal natives here. And there were some things that were created and cultivated from foundation of black Americans and slavery. So all of these things came together and became a foundation of black American custom. Um, people get voodoo and hoodoo mixed up. Voodoo is basically, the, you, you worship a deity. Voodoo is a religion, okay? Voodoo is a religion. Yes, yeah, somebody said Dr. Sebi is more like hoodoo. And Dr. Sebi has spoken about how black Americans, we are closer to liberation than any other group, especially in Africa, because we don't have um, the tribal differences. But hoodoo is a primarily foundational black American package. They try to say, no, 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 because no, hoodoo is not a religion. Hoodoo is really about healing, wellness, connecting to um, nature and the spirit realm. But it's not where you're worshiping one deity like voodoo. Voodoo is a religion. Hoodoo, you're tapping into the spirit realm. You're tapping into the plants, the trees, the weather. You, you, you're using your spiritual essence to tap into some of those frequencies. Okay? And we understood a lot of this stuff when we were enslaved and coming out of slavery. And there's a reason why they started making hoodoo a negative thing. The hoodoo practitioners were also called root workers. Now they say herbalists, but a lot of the hoodoo practitioners, they would call them conjurers, they would call them root workers. That's why we named the deodorant root work. That was a very common term. We as foundational black Americans, we understood the agrarian culture and how to tap in to these natural energies. People like George Washington Carver, he was a root man, all right? We got a lot of power from that stuff. That's why it's been erased from our culture. George Washington Carver, black people in the black press during his lifetime, they referred to him as a root man, all right? Want y'all to understand. So how is this different from Wiccan? No, this is, that European stuff is different. Because with us, man, with the hoodoo, with the root work, you got to have a certain spirit with that. And we were tapping into some of the, the ancestors who suffered, and some of them said, we're going to pass our spirit to you, so I'll sacrifice myself so you use my spirit so that you can get some out the game. When we look at a lot of things that our people did coming out of slavery and during slavery, one thing that's kind of erased, a lot of them were practicing root work. A lot of them were practicing hoodoo. And it's never talked about because we actually, you know, hoodoo is not witchcraft at all. Hoodoo is not witchcraft. It's an herbalist. Somebody said it's basically an herbalist, but it's an herbalist where you, you're tapping into the spirit realm. You're getting... You, you're connecting with the, the roots and the plants, and you're also tapping into these things spiritually. That's why there were certain rituals that went with it. And I want you to look, we got to understand something. Let's, let's look at it from the scientific standpoint. We understood that plants, roots, plants, trees, we understood that plants have neurotransmitters. Let's just talk science for a minute. Plants have neurotransmitters. Plants can give off energy, all right? 
This is science. Plants can give you energy. Plants can receive energy. All right? Plants can give energy. Plants can receive energy. Spirits are energies. A lot of our foundational black American families, when they were practicing hoodoo, practicing root work, some of them would infuse themselves in plants. They would draw back out the spirits out of the plants. They would come up with these different rituals to do this. Yeah, Bobby Hammond spoke on this a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of putting it in simplistic terms, but we knew how to connect our spiritual essence in plants, and we knew how to get all the good properties out of plants. Some people would send their spirit to plants and say, hey, if you need me, go to that plant and get the spirit back out. Plants whole energy and spirits, positive and negative. Yeah, George Washington Carver said he can talk to plants. That's why the white people got him. And let me tell you something, if you see one black person who white people got, that means there's a thousand others like him. We have to understand there were thousands of George Washington Carvers, all right? We had a bunch of them. White people just happened to get him because they saw that he was a root man and they, they we, let's keep him for us. Let's keep him for us because he was willing to just share all of his stuff because he didn't have, they castrated him when he was young, so he wasn't passing anything down. So he was like, hey, if y'all white people want to share my knowledge, hey, I ain't got no family, so here, I give it to you. So they, come on, nigga. Because most of us, let me tell you something, I want black folks to understand this. When slavery was over, black people Yes, you actually can. To be honest, you can use root money. You you can use hoodoo and root work to get money because that's what our families were doing. I'm telling you guys, this is not talked about. Black people who were root workers and herbalists and, and hoodoo people, they were making a grip after slavery, and that's why it became a problem. Black people were making a grip out after slavery doing root work. It's never talked about. It's never talked about. But going back to what I was saying about the plants, plants can give energy and they can receive energy. They've done several experiments with plants showing that a plant, if you bully a plant, the plant will wilter and die. If you talk to a plant, they always tell you to talk to plants and talk positively to plants because plants can feel your energy. So these students, they did this experiment at a school, and, and they do these experiments all the time with plants. Let me show you all this, where they nurture one plant, they get the same plant from the same place, put it in like the same type of setting. One plant, they will bully it, the other plant, they will nurture it, and then they watch the results. The plant that gets bullied, the plant that receives negative energy, it dies quickly. There have been several experiments doing this, and let me show you all this right here. Just to show you how the the plant thing is real. Plants can give and feel energy. Hold on. These are like yellow. I don't think that's good. 11-year-old Samantha Petragli and her mom are still trying to nurse this dead plant back to life after the fifth graders class killed it and not with kindness. I feel sad about the bully plant because I don't like to see anything die. For her science fair project this year, the Comac girl and her mom bought two of the same types of plants from the same nursery. Both were then placed on the same windowsill inside her classroom. But this way it was even. They had the same amount of water the same amount of sunlight. The only difference, one was verbally complimented every day by Samantha's classmates, and the other was bullied. Students tracked it all by a checklist. So the rules were, with bullying the plant, say mean things to it. Call the plant ugly. Call the plant fat. Call the plant you know, stupid. The plant that was bullied began to wilt right away, and after just six days, it died, while the one that received compliments continued to grow. So, all right, so I'm just giving y'all that, letting you know they've done experiments based on this. Plants are very receptive, all right? Pant, plants, this is just science. Pant, plants have neural melanin, not, not normal, but they have um, neurotransmitters, all right? Plants have neurotransmitters, and we know that. We've always known that. And we, we knew how to use, um, where's, my, where's my mods? Where are my mods? Where are my mods in here? Hold on, where, where are my moderators? My moderators, where you at? Because we got some um, some buffoons in here. 
trying to promote their damn pages. We're my mods, all right. But listen, they've always they done a done a similar experiment with water too. Um, they got like water talk to the water in a positive way, and then talk to the water in a negative way, and then the water turned different dark colors, got brown, and it started looking rusty. So water plants, these are living things. These are living things. And we understood that. We understood the energy of plants. Plants give you energy and you can give plants energy. And we could put our energy and some of our people could put their spirit in these plants and then draw the spirit back out through ritualistic means. So we really understood that. Um, and we got a lot of power from that too. This is why they started making it illegal for us to start messing with these roots because we were using this hoodoo. We were using the energy of the plants. We were using hoodoo to free ourselves from plantations. This is not talked about. And a lot of times, some of our folks were killing these white supremacists with that hoodoo. They were getting vengeance with it. I'm telling y'all some real stuff. They were shook behind that hoodoo stuff. They didn't like that, the white supremacists, because we were using that to our advantage. If you look at a lot of people who got off plantations, there's many stories of them actually using hoodoo. And a lot of black people were using it to get free. Um, in 1748 in Virginia, they made it a law where it was illegal. They said, black folks, we can't, y'all can't be out here doing that root work. You can't be um, sitting up with these plants and you can't do that. 1748, they stopped that for a second. They told black folks, y'all doing too much. They made it illegal. Y'all look up the law, 1748, Virginia. We can't have these Negroes messing with these roots and these concoctions, all of these root people. Y'all got to cut that out. Somebody said, yeah, looked like somebody put a root on Mitch McConnell, didn't it? Did y'all see Mitch McConnell? This, uh, you, you hit that on the money. I'm thinking, did somebody put a root on his ass? Did y'all see Mitch McConnell? Let me, let me find that clip of Mitch McConnell. It looked like somebody put a hoodoo on his ass, didn't it? Because remember, he's up here against reparations. He's against reparations. Let me see something. Hold on, let me let me show that of him. That's a funny clip where he froze. Uh, is this it? Hold on one second. Uh, hope this is it. What is it? Uh, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Uh, come on, thing. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, come on, stop buffering. Okay, hold on. If it stops buffering. Okay, why are you buffering? Okay, here it is. So this is Mitch McConnell. All right, this is Mitch McConnell. Hold on. Somebody put a hoodoo on his ass. Look at Mitch. Somebody hit it right. That's the first thing I thought. Did somebody put a root on this nigga? That's what the, the term, I'm going to put a root on you. That's what it literally means that. I'm going to get a root and put this root spirit on your ass. I'm going to conjure up a, a, an ancestor who's trying to get vengeance, get this root, chew it up, and spit it on your ass. Hold on. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're on a path to finishing the NDA uh, this week. It's been good bipartisan cooperation and a string of. Uh, uh... <laughs> Somebody to put a root on this dude. The ancestors then got his ass. Look at him. He fr he's stuck. Nigga, the ancestors done put a root on that ass. They don't know what to do. Anything else you want to say? Or should we just go back to They don't know what to do with it. Anything else to the press? I think he done crapped his draws. Let's go back to Go ahead, John. Oh, the ancestors got his ass. <laughs> oh, somebody got a root on his ass. Oh. 
<laughs> the ancestors say the ancestors got him stuck on stupid. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Somebody, he glitched. Yeah, his batteries died. But the, the, the ancestors, that's what he get for not, for, for hating on reparations. Oh, remember, he was hella hating on reparations. Boy, the ancestors came through. It was like, all right, well, we're going to take some of this. Huh? But listen, listen, man, we were doing this hoodoo. We were using it to off these damn white supremacists on the plantation. We, could, we were using it for good things, for vengeance, for righteous vengeance, and they knew it. Their slave narratives where they talked about somebody going to the swamp and getting a root and chewing the root and spitting it out towards the, the slave owner or whatever, and they doing a hoodoo ritual, and then a week later, the slave master die. This was happening regularly on these plantations. That's why the white supremacists knew it was happening. They were like, no, we got y'all can't be doing all that. Now, it's hard for you to stop people from getting with these roots. We had to do the shit in private. We didn't stop because they were like, well, we're going to kill y'all. if We see y'all mixing roots. So we had to be very covert with it. We had to be very covert. They also did the same thing in um, South Carolina with the Gullah Geechees. The Gullah Geechees were big on that. That's one of the reasons they didn't really mess with the Gullah Geechees like that. They say they left the Gullah Geechees alone um, on some of those islands around South Carolina because, well, the white people didn't want to go and um, be around all those mosquitoes because of the malaria. That's one reason. But another reason, they didn't want to be too close to them Gullah Geechees because them Gullahs was hitting their ass with that hoodoo. Them Gullahs was hitting them with that hoodoo and that root work. Nat Turner was dealing with hoodoo too. That's why he kept saying he kept having them visions and he saw signs from the, the weather and all of that stuff. That's hoodoo. You know? That's hoodoo stuff. So out there in South Carolina, 1749, they made it illegal there too. They're like, hey, these Negroes, we can't have them out here messing with these roots. Because the thing is, a lot of black folks, you had a brother named Dr. Caesar. Shout out to the Gullah Geechees. There was a brother, I, wanted, I think he was in South Carolina. He, um, they called him Dr. Caesar. He was a root man. Dr. Caesar came up with the first snake bite antidote. We were the ones who, who knew medicine like that. We were the first people they were going to for medicine in early America. Dr. Caesar got his freedom. from I talked about that before, from saving people using root work. He knew how to put things together and clear snake and, and, and cure snake bites. And they were like, hey, nigga, give us that formula. He's like, yeah, I give it to you. Let a player get some of that freedom, though. They gave him freedom and a pension. So we were using a lot of that stuff to our advantage. Um, one of the first recognized root work doctors from the plantation was another sister named Jane Minor. Yeah, I'm t listen, there's so many of our foundation of black American ancestors who were practicing root work and doing phenomenal things with it. There was a sister, I think she was in Virginia. I wanna say she was in Virginia. Her name was Jane Minor. She was doing root work on the plantations. This is early 1800s. Now, they had made a law against black people doing the root work openly, but there was um, like a fever outbreak in Virginia, so a lot of white people were dying. So you gotta understand, you, the white doctors back then, they were not thorough. The white doctors were not thorough back then. I want y'all to understand our history, man. Y'all better understand what they got from us, man. I want y'all to understand what they got from us. The, the white society had to go to us because we the, we knew the herbs. We knew how to heal people. White doctors didn't know all that stuff back then. Back in those days, 1800s, 1700s, all they knew was to, whatever hurt, just chop it off. That was their motto. Nigga, if something hurt, if your leg got hurt, if you just chop it off. And remember, it was a brother, um, Onesimus, in Massachusetts, he was the one who came up with the cure for smallpox. It was a brother, black dude. If you look at the slave narratives and look at the documents, we were the ones who were coming up with these cures because we were the ones dealing with herbs. 
White doctors didn't know that stuff. And if they tried, they became what would be known as quacks. They would try to do their white version of root work. And basically, they would do shit like sell snake oil. That's where the term snake oil salesman comes from. They sell some fake BS and lie about it. They didn't know what they were doing. You did? They had no idea what they were doing. If you really wanted to get healed, you had to go to black people. Yeah, they would just chop your shit off. Yeah, yeah, my stomach hurt. Well, let's cut some of your stomach off. They didn't know what they were doing. And white people know they didn't know what they were doing. So white people were going to the black root doctors. Look up Jane Minor. And not only did this sister heal these people and save the towns from this, this fever outbreak, she got her freedom. They said, hey, we're gonna, she did such a good job, we're gonna give her her freedom. That sister um, became one of the first doctors in that area based on root work. She was doing root work. She was going around healing people, getting two, three, four, five dollars a pop, five dollars a house call. That's a lot of money in the 1800s. The sister saved up a lot of money to emancipate other black people. She. Um, free damn near uh, two dozen other black people. She was going around getting her money to free other black people. I want y'all to understand our culture. This is our culture of root work. A lot of things that we use in root work has gone into the mainstream lexicon. Even in the black church, a lot of stuff that we do in the black church, we get from hoodoo, actually, because they were using hoodoo and they were infusing it with Christianity. So it wasn't a separate religion like voodoo. There were Christian, there would be Christian people, but they would be who, um, hoodoo and root workers. You understand? A lot of people, you have somebody, will you go to your grandmother because she was a healer? Dude, I'm telling you, black people who were root workers at one point were making more money than white medical doctors who were universally trained in this country, dude. That was the problem. Yeah, a lot of, like I was saying about the black church, a lot of the things we do in the black church comes from the hoodoo, the whole concept of catching the spirit, catching the Holy Ghost. You, oh, I caught a spirit, that's from hoodoo. Yeah, the door-to-door -door nurses, the, the house calls and stuff, we were doing that stuff. I want y'all to understand, and this has been deliberately hidden. This has been hidden from us. Now, to be clear, there were root workers who did practice voodoo too, especially down in Louisiana. You did have root workers who did mix in some voodoo too. So that's why people kind of get things confused. One famous root worker slash voodoo woman down in Louisiana was a sister named uh, Marie Laveau. Where are my Louisiana people? Where are my people from Louisiana? All my Louisiana people. Y'all know about Marie Laveau? If you go down to Louisiana, there's a lot of stuff named after Marie Laveau down there. She was a real sister, thorough sister. She practiced voodoo and hoodoo too. And let me tell you something. They didn't fuck with that woman down there. White people didn't mess with her because she was the real deal. It was rumored that that woman would get both. She would use hoodoo and voodoo to get people killed. If they crossed her, they did something she didn't like, they'd be dead a week later. You, you understand? Marie Laveau was nobody to fuck with down there in Louisiana. Look her up. In fact, what's that show with Angela Bassett? Angela Bassett played her on, uh, what's that show? Angela Bassett played her. God, I forgot that show. My wife loves that show. But Angela Bassett played her recently on, on that. If y'all help me out, I forgot the name of that show. But um, Marie Laveau was nobody to play with. Yeah, y'all know about the Seven Sisters? There were some other women down there in Louisiana called the Seven Sisters who were root workers. Who made them, These sisters made a grip. They made a lot of money down there because white people were going to them. But yeah, Marie Laveau, this was a sister, and everybody knew she practiced voodoo, and she was not a joke. American Horror Story, yes, that's the show, yes. American Horror Story. Yeah, Angela Bassett played Marie Laveau. That's the show, that's right. And Marie Laveau was the real deal. Marie Laveau, would, um, everybody would go to her, um, black people and white people.
the white people would go to her too. So she made a grip. She would uh, free a lot of people. She would help a lot of black people who were in court cases. She was like, hey, you go to court. Um, I'm going to chew this root. And then I'm going to give you this, put it in your pocket, and you're going to get acquitted. And it would happen. She would, it was a lot of stuff going on with her. And it's, it was rumored that she used that voodoo and hoodoo to off a lot of the white people down there who crossed her. Anybody who crossed her, she put that root on their ass, and then they'd be up out of here. She had a lot of political influence because they were scared of her down there. They, they let that woman walk the streets. And when she walked around, she walked into the white neighborhoods. <laughs> they were like, oh, right this way, Miss Laveau. All right, that's what I thought. Oh, yeah, they, they, they moved to the other side of the street when she walked down. They were not trying to play games with her ass. Marie, they respect her to this day down there. They, <clears throat> they go down to her grave and you, if you, they say if you mark three X's on the grave, that'll be good luck. <clears throat> so, yeah, Marie Laveau. They don't tell you about some of these ancestors and who they were and the respect that they got. And if you look at a lot of other prominent black folks, um, and um, there was a brother who was a senator in North Carolina, William Moore. That brother practiced root work. He stopped being a senator and, and started practicing root work full time. Yeah. Um, Biddy Mason. I always talk about Biddy Mason in Los Angeles. She was a root worker. That's why she made a lot of money. She made a lot of money healing people, doing those money rituals, and them shits would work. She made, became one of the richest women in the state. The second rich woman in the state was Mary Ellen Pleasant up in San Francisco, up in the Bay. Mary Ellen Pleasant, that was another root worker. Some people said that I think she, she went to Louisiana, learned the game from Marie Laveau, and came out here, well, out to California. Mary Ellen Pleasant. She was practicing root work too. A lot. They don't tell you all this stuff. They'll tell you about these people. They'll tell you about the success that they have. But they don't tell you all the stuff they were into, especially root work. We were getting a lot of strength from root work. Um, in fact, one of the, the, out here in New York, there was a slave uprising in New York in 1712. 1712, there was a, a, a slave revolt here in New York. I'm in New York right now. The revolt was started by a brother called Peter the Doctor, who was a root worker. What he did, they got tired of being, you know, um, dominated and mistreated by the white supremacists. So these brothers got some roots and herbs and made a concoction and covered their bodies with it and went in the street and started slicing and dicing the white supremacists, burning down buildings. This was 1710. Uh, not 17, 1712 here in New York. Look that up. Look up the New York um, slave revolt of 1712. Peter the doctor was the foundational black American man who got that popping. And he was a root worker and they did a hoodoo ritual in order to get the strength because I think they knew they were going to sacrifice themselves. So they wanted to use whatever root they covered themselves in so that other black people could go to that root and get strength from it when they needed it. You understand? A lot of us were using root work. A lot of our ancestors that, that are prominent. Frederick Douglass, he talks about going to a root worker hoodoo doctor because when Frederick Douglass was a, a, a youth, he was sold to different people. He got sold to a hardcore white supremacist named Ed Covey. I think that's his last name, Ed Covey. Ed Covey, and, and, and Frederick Douglass was about 16. Frederick, Ed Covey was a slave breaker. He was one of these white supremacists that you would send your slaves to in order to get broken. So Frederick Douglass went to this guy and he was beating Frederick just relentlessly every other day, just beating him for no reason. And his wounds couldn't even heal because he just kept getting beaten by this white man. So Frederick said, I got to go to a hoodoo man. I got to go to one of the root workers, man, because this white man is about to break my spirit. This dude is killing my body and my, my spirit is about to just go. This guy is literally breaking my spirit. So Frederick Douglass went to a root worker. He went to a hoodoo worker who was enslaved too. The hoodoo worker said, hey, look, let me take you out here to the woods. He gave Frederick Douglass a certain root. 
I think, and they didn't specify, I'm thinking it might have been the High John the Conqueror route, but they never specified what route it was. The hoodoo man, the root worker, gave Frederick Douglass that root and said, Fred, put this in your right pocket. Keep this in your right pocket. Take this wherever you go. You keep that root with you. No white man will ever harm you again. No white man will ever harm you again. So Frederick got that root. Frederick went back to the plantation. Ed Covey, the white supremacist slave breaker, tried to raise up on him, tried to beat Frederick again. This time Frederick, drawing in those spirits, Frederick beat the shit out of that white man. Frederick whooped that man's ass. And the man never messed with Fred no more. He never ever tried to raise up on Fred. Frederick Douglass was never harmed by another white man ever. He eventually got his freedom and, and went on to gain prominence. Look up, he talked about that in his autobiography. You see? A lot of us were getting strength from that. A lot of us were getting strength from root work. That's the thing that's not talked about. And you had... Um, a lot of brothers and sisters who were making a lot of money doing that because white people were going to them. You had a brother named um, Jimmy Brisbane out of South Carolina. This brother made a grip doing root work. There was a brother named Dr. Jim Jordan out of North Carolina. This brother was a millionaire doing root work and his whole thing was, hey, if my shit don't work, don't pay me. Only pay me if it's working. That's how thorough he was. Dr. Jim Jordan out of North Carolina. He died in 1962. This brother was wealthy because white people were going to these folks. White people were going to him because white people knew. All right? White people knew that these brothers were thorough. Yeah, Frederick was putting hands on the slave master. But look up Dr. Jim Jordan. He was a very wealthy root worker. Going back into slavery, a brother named Henry Bibb, who got his freedom before he got his freedom. He, he escaped the plantation on Christmas. Uh, he got some, some roots and some herbs. They told him to chew the root and spit it towards the slave owner. Then he ended up getting his freedom. I mean, just all across the board, man. Another famous brother out of South Carolina, I want to say he was a Gullah Geechee, is a brother named Dr. Buzzard. He was a very famous root worker in the early 20th century. Everybody was going to Dr. Buzzard. White people were, yeah, they don't tell you this part of history. There were so many of us, and I'm telling you about people who were famous in their day, who were making a grip, healing people. The white people were going to these folks because they knew that black folks were the real deal. There's a reason why, family, there's a reason why they put black people's faces on products back in those days because they knew we were the real McCoy. They knew we were the real deal. Even though sometimes they would use caricatures. You remember Dr. Buzzard and Holly? Yeah. That name, Dr. Buzzard, was a very famous name. His brand was so famous, you had other people pretending to be um, Dr. Buzzard. Yeah? Yeah, it, hoodoo is not dark. It's not dark at all, man. It's not dark at all. It's something that we use to get us through um, slavery hardships, and we were getting strength from that. We were getting strength from it. Hoodoo and root work was something that was working for us. And see, that's why it became a problem. And again, you had some, I'm telling y'all, just some of the people, there's so many to name. You had another sister. Okay, again, Dr. Buzzard, look up Dr. Buzzard. Dr. Buzzard, to this day, he's buried in South Carolina. People go to his grave to this day and they scoop up the dirt and take the dirt as souvenirs so that they can have it for good luck and good health. Because they say, if you go to a root worker's grave and take the dirt, that will bring good tidings and, and good energy to you. But these people understand who we are. Man, y'all remember the movie The Green Mile? John Coffey? John Coffey, the character, he was a, a hoodoo man. Even in the script of the movie, they refer to him as a hoodoo man. That's why he was doing all of those magic tricks and all of that stuff. They embellished a lot of stuff. But that was based on the hoodoo men. And the message was, and look at the message that, that comes from movies like that. John Coffey, the character, they had him healing people. He had to go heal the, the jailer's wife and all of that stuff. And the message was, hey, look, we know that these Negroes got certain powers. Even if they're innocent, we got to use their power and get them up out of here. 
Let's get over it, white people. That was a message to white society. Yes, we know these Negroes. Yeah, we know they got certain powers that we don't have. We know that many of them are innocent, but these niggas are dangerous. We got to keep them caged up, but use their powers, but keep them caged up. You, you dig? Yeah. John Coffey, right, the Green Mile. He was a hoodoo man. He was a hoodoo man. He was a root worker. That's where the power and all that shit was coming from. Yeah? Daughters of the Dust, South Carolina. I'm telling you that this stuff, we knew what the game was. We would make songs about the hoodoo, um, 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 Hi John the Conqueroo. We would make songs about this stuff. That's our culture. That's part of our culture. We were getting a lot of strength from that, man. We knew how to tap into these these herbs we knew how to tap into the weather we knew how to really tap into nature man and again the, the white supremacists the best they can do is be snake oil salesmen which was you know phony root workers that's why white people wanted to go to us they didn't want to deal with them snake oil salesmen they knew that these people were phony they they wanted to go to the real deal and again george washington carver he was a root man and we had thousands of george washington carvers out here yeah and let me tell you something. There was a situation speaking of Louisiana. And, and, and also another thing, many midwives, that's why they had to stop the midwives. Many midwives were practicing root work too. Remember, there was a time when only black women were delivering babies. When you wanted a baby delivered, you had to go to sisters. That's again, Biddy Mason. That's why she made so much money. Um, Foundation of Black American Women were making a grip um, delivering babies because we knew how to set the scene. We knew how to um, use the right herbs. Um, the sisters were putting certain herbs around the house so that the baby can come in from the spirit realm clean and protected. There were certain rituals that you had to do. And white people knew, hey, if you want a healthy baby, we got to go to them negresses and have them deliver our babies. And they saw all the money sisters were making doing that. We were making a lot of money. Yeah, we used to have mojo bags. A lot of us would have the mojo bags with us. You understand? Yeah, Erica Badu, shout out to Erica Badu. She's a, a doula. But sisters were the, the midwives, and they were using hoodoo. They were using all natural stuff. They were using root work to bring these babies in. And that's why they had to stop it because they were making too much money. So then all of a sudden, well, you got to have a license. Yeah, that whole license thing. Anytime they start with that license stuff, usually that's designed to keep us out. Remember a few weeks ago, I talked about how South Carolina, anybody could practice law. All you had to do was graduate from law school. You can go practice law. When so many black people were going to law school and graduating and then helping other black people, they were like, oh, you got to go through the bar. Mm. Well, I know you went to law school, but there's a whole new process called the bar. Now you got to get your lawyer license through the bar. You got to go through us. And uh, I don't know about all you Negroes. We're going we gonna to throw some obstacles in there for you Negroes. They did that same thing with the midwives. Um, there was a midwife who delivered one of our children. And she was the last midwife in L.A. And they ended up getting her out of here. They threw all the red tape on her in order to be a midwife now. If you black... You got to go through so many damn hurdles, especially in California. A black midwife, you got to go through hurdles, dude. And they, they, they did that stuff. They make you go through hurdles in order to deter you from doing that. But a lot of our people were medicine folks because, listen, black folks, we were getting the, the money from the black community. The black folks was coming to us because black people, remember, Old black folks did not go to hospitals. Even, even to this day, old black folks don't like no damn hospitals. We weren't trying to go to no damn university doctor because we knew they didn't know shit. And number two, we didn't trust them. We knew they were doing experiments on us and we didn't want to go to their, their hospitals and end up dying. We knew going to the universally trained white hospitals and doctors was a problem. We stayed out of them shits, dude, because we had people in our community who hooked us up. We had people in our community who knew what they were doing. You understand? We could take care of ourselves. We knew not to go to those doctors. Those old black folks do not like going to doctors, even to this day. And white people didn't like that either. White people would go down to these root workers. There was a sister named um, 
Aunt Caroline Dye out of um, Arkansas, I think. She was from South Carolina, but she ended up going to Arkansas. This was a sister early 1900s. Made a grip, a very popular root woman, hoodoo woman. And she was also what's called a seer, where she tapped in so deep into the energy where she could see certain things, see things through the spirit realm, and she was very accurate with stuff. And this woman made a grip and never even asked for money. She never asked for money, but she made a lot of money because she was so thorough, people would just throw money at her. People would send her money all the time. So this woman ended up getting hundreds of thousands of dollars, buying all types of property. And Aunt Caroline Dye, look that name up, very famous sister. She looks just like my grandmother. When you see pictures of Aunt Caroline Dye, um, she, uh, the spitting image of my grandmother. Very famous sister, white people. Yes, yeah, she was a seer, if you know about hoodoo. She could see things, so people would go to her, get healed, and also if they lost stuff, somebody would go to her and say, Aunt Caroline, my donkey, somebody stole my donkey. I don't know where my donkey is. So she would conjure up roots and light certain things up and be like, hey, your donkey is in Memphis, three houses down from 8th Street. And then they would go to 8th Street and three houses down, and the damn donkey would be there. She would do that type of stuff and would freak people out, but she would be accurate to the point where all the white business people out there in Arkansas, they wouldn't even make business decisions before they went and talked to her ass. Die, D-Y-E, Caroline Die. Her last name is D-Y-E, Aunt Caroline Die. Yep, she was in Arkansas, thorough sister. I, and I'm, I'm people all around the country went to her. White people were going to this sister because they knew what the deal was. They were tapped in. These sisters, you, they were tapped in, man. Real heavy stuff, dude. Yeah, if you're born with a veil on your face, yeah, that was another thing. What's that? There's what's that thing on your face? Some kids they're born with um, like a little film over their face. It's very harmless. You can take it off. But they said if you're born with that, you got the power immediately. Yeah, Aunt Caroline Dye, yes. Thorough sister, very well respected. A popular root woman back in those days. Yeah, she lived, I, I want to say a hundred and something. Yeah, she was about a hundred and something when she died. Yeah. Yeah, she, when, they, when she died, they went to her house and there was a gang of money in her house. This woman, her energy was so pure. Her energy was so real. People just get, threw money at her. And she didn't even ask for it. They just threw money at their sister. Yeah? And let me tell you something. They knew how real this shit was. Because we could use that to get vengeance too. There was a sister in Frenier, Louisiana. Where are my Louisiana people? There's a sister who was in Frenier, Louisiana. Now, Frenier, it's spelled like Frenier, but it's pronounced Frenier. It's right outside New Orleans. So there was a sister named Julia Brown. Early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. So Julia Brown was a root woman. There was a small town, a lot of German immigrants, and there was a sister there with her husband. Um, they didn't have access to a lot of the medical stuff, so Julia was the, the, the root woman. She was the, the town healer. The people there in the town, Julia Brown, in Frenier, she was the woman everybody went to to get healed. She would heal everybody. She was the, the neighborhood doctor. And she would heal people, but they kind of took her for granted and she didn't like it. She was a hoodoo woman, a root woman, and they would call on her to get healed, but she would heal people and they would kind of shit on her. You know, they would, you know, this is the, the height of Jim Crow. They would be very discriminatory towards her and she'd like, hey. You know, I'm healing you people and you guys going to kind of treat me, you know, try to come at me sideways. Okay, well, listen. No, she didn't like that. They, they crossed her. She didn't like being mistreated based on race after helping all these white people. So, Frenia, uh, so, so Julia, there were reports of her sitting on a porch. She had a, a, a house after her husband died. She was by herself. So she had a house on the edge of the swamp in Frenier. And this sister played her guitar and she would sing a song. 
and it would scare the white people. She would sing this song like, when I die, I'm taking Frenier with me. She kept singing this song over and over again. She would sit on a porch every day and sing this song. When I die, I'm taking the whole town with me. When I die, I'm taking Frenier with me. When I die, I'm taking Frenier with me. And the white people were like, oh, damn, why is she saying that? What the hell is she saying that for? So she kept singing this song. She kept singing. And there's eyewitnesses of people saying they kept hearing her sing this song. When I die, I'm taking Frenier with me. When I die, I'm taking the whole town with me. Everybody sing along now. When I die, I'm taking, and this was spooking the ass. So she died September, I want to say 28th, 1915. She died. So now the white people are like, oh shit, uh-oh. So she died. So the white people are like, well damn, let's go to her funeral and let's pay respect because I know we kind of shitted on her when she was alive, but let's go to the funeral. Let's pay respect so her spirit don't raise up on our ass. So they have the funeral, I think on the 29th or 30th, they go to the funeral, they have a funeral for her. Funeral starts at around two o'clock. All the white people show up to the funeral trying to pay respect at the last minute. At four o'clock, during the funeral, a hurricane comes through. <laughs> kills half the white people in town and completely wipes the town out. <laughs> Nigga, look up the 1915 hurricane, Louisiana. Look up the 19, the, the hurricane came during the funeral, dude, and wiped the whole town out exactly like she said. White folks, they abandoned that town and ain't been back since. That shit is a ghost town to this day. The white people don't touch that town. They never tried to rebuild that. They said that woman's spirit and ghost is still there. Look that up. Look that up. This is very well documented. They don't like talking about that shit. Look up what I just told you. This is very well documented. In the local paper, they kept talking about how that woman said that the town was going to get destroyed when she died and the shit happened. You know? That's why they don't like playing with this thing. They don't like playing with this thing. They don't like, let's not tell these niggas about that hoodoo shit. Yeah, it killed 300 people. They thought she was bullshitting. You know? They never rebuilt that town. They're like, we're going to stay as far away from that town as possible. Over there now, there's just a little shallow grave for all the people who died. The, literally, the whole town got wiped out. Literally everything. Yeah? A Category 4 hurricane took that shit out. Yeah? Y'all better understand what the ancestors were tapped into. Oh, it could be dangerous if you, you know... Yeah, look up the lost city of Frenier. Look up the lost city of Frenier. Yeah, they don't like play, they don't like talking about that. Yeah. How the sister predicted and she told him she was going to wipe it out when she died and and did it. They keep saying she was a voodoo. She was not a voodoo woman. She was a hoodoo woman. She was a root worker. Julia Brown was not a voodoo. See, they kind of, the white supremacists kind of throw voodoo and hoodoo all together. Um, Julia Brown was a hoodoo worker. She was doing hoodoo and root work. Yeah? But this is the thing. Like I said, black people were using that to tap into power. They were using that to tap into power. And they were making too much money. And when we start making too much money, that's a problem. And early 1900s, you got all these black people becoming millionaires, doing root work, working as doctors, making more money than white people doing this stuff. And at the time, you had the Rockefeller machine that was using the petrochemicals and then tapping into the medical industry, creating the, med the modern medical industry as we know it with all of the chemicals that was created by Rockefeller and those guys. So the Rockefeller folks, 19, around the 1920s and 30s, they had to clamp down on all of these root workers. They said, okay, these niggas are making too much money. 
I'm trying to get into the medical industry. I got to get a monopoly on this stuff. So what they did, they started studying the root workers. They started studying what black people were doing. So if they got a certain root, a certain herb, the Rockefeller team, they would say, okay, they got some echinacea, whatever. Let's look, let's look at the property in echinacea that works and then let's put some chemicals around that and then patent it. Because you can't patent a root. You understand? See, the root workers were doing their thing, but what you cannot do, you cannot patent a root, but you can find out the properties in that root that heals people, that has its power, and then put some synthetic man-made chemicals around it, which is what the Rockefeller folks were doing, and then patent that. Then you, that's ibuprofen. Then I'm on patent that, and I, then I own that. And here's the problem. With all those petrochemicals in the ibuprofen or whatever thing that they've concocted, they'll use the strengthening property of the root, but then the chemicals is going to give you something else and you're going to need something to cure that. So there's a, an endless cycle of having to cure the diseases that the damn chemicals from the medicine gave you. We didn't start getting cancer until they started making all of these petrochemicals. Most of um, the, the medicine that we have now, if we look at um, like aspirin, gel tabs, um, certain sprays, a lot of that stuff comes from petrochemicals, meaning petroleum, oil. It's um, subparticles of some of these petroleum chemicals that they use to make Vaseline and ointments and all of this other stuff. So there's a lot of side effects because you're dealing with chemicals that they're mixing with this stuff. That's why I, I wanted to do the deodorant thing because I was using deodorant and a lot of deodorants, man, they'll try to lie. A lot of deodorants, man, that has chemicals in them, that have chemicals, it's tied to breast cancer. They know that. The, the American Cancer Association will say no, but that's owned by Rockefeller too. You see, they'll give you cancer and then the, the pharmaceutical companies owned by the Rockefellers will say, hey, man, take this. This is going to cure you. Then when you get cancer, his cancer association that he owns, we didn't give it. No, 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 no. That, those chemicals from my other plant over there, it didn't give you cancer. But yeah, I, man, I would use deodorant. What you put under your arms is very important too, dude. What you put under your arms is very important. Your, your fibroids and thyroids, all that stuff is in there. But yeah, a lot of um, deodorant, man, I would use some of these deodorants and I would get these lumps under my arm. You know, they got aluminum and all of that stuff. And I'm real big on that. We... Everyday products, man. Yeah, that aluminum, that aluminum will get your ass. That aluminum will get you. You got to watch what you put under your arms because we don't think about that. You see, we try to eat natural and do natural things, and then you put some chemicals under your arm, man. That'll tear your ass up, especially women and dudes too. Man, I was getting lumps under my arms with some of those um, aerosol sprays, and I looked and there was so many chemicals in it, so I had to start doing natural stuff. Yeah. So that's why I was big on doing the deodorant, like root work. This is all natural. It smells good and good energy, good roots in it. That's why this was important. That's why a deodorant was very important. It's something that you use every day, and it's something that, that, that helps you. Yeah, your lymph nodes and your lymph glands. Yeah, you put certain things under your arm that ain't right, man. It'll, it'll jack your shit up, man. It'll really mess you up. But again, they saw... All of these black folks making this paper, and they had to erase that. They said, no, 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 we got to get in on this. Now, what we're going to do to get rid of all of these herbal um, hoodoo people, we got to demonize hoodoo. So they started tying that in with voodoo, and they started using propaganda. They started going to the white media, and they were like, oh, these demonic Negroes doing hoodoo and voodoo. Look at them. They're primitive. Right around that time, they started having the um, Food and Drug Administration. That's the Rockefeller thing, too. They had the Food and Drug Administration, the, the, the FDA. So now you got any kind of food or drugs. If you say you're going to heal somebody, you got to go through them. That's Rockefeller. They, they created all of that shit. He was behind that. He's like, hey, he went to the politicians, kicked in some money. Hey, listen. All these niggas doing all that root work and stuff with herbs. Let's have something where you got to go through another body commission in order to get a license or even to practice medicine or to say you're going to heal somebody. So even to this day, 
you can't say that a herb is going to heal somebody. That's why the FDA start running up in herbal shops like the goddamn, um, like the DEA, like drugs are in there. You know? That's why they treat herbal um, doctors, they treat them like cocaine dealers. You know, they start running and doing raids on herbal medicine practitioners like crazy. Yeah, They shut that down real quick. Even if you get an herb, that's what Dr. Sebi, remember? They drugged Dr. Sebi in court in the 80s. See, that's what his whole thing was. They drugged Dr. Sebi in court. Remember, what they were trying to get Dr. Sebi on was was saying that you can heal people, but he was like, but no, no. Saying that you can heal people and practicing medicine without a license. It was something like that because Dr. Sebi was like, hey, I'm curing people of AIDS. Yeah, I'm curing people of AIDS. And they, oh, you can't say that now. And then you start bringing in all these people like, look, I cured him. They're testifying that I'm curing him. Here's the documents, they had AIDS. When they left me, they didn't have it no more. So he, they drug him in court, and then he actually won his case. And then they were real quiet about that. They were very quiet about that, but that was the thing they drug him in the court for. They were trying to get him for the whole practicing medicine without a license. Even though you can heal somebody, you can't go out here saying it. Yeah, even if you can heal somebody, don't say it. Yeah? So after Dr. Sebi, they really started cracking down on that stuff. They started running up in these herbal shops like crazy. Yeah? They started running up in them herbal medicine shops like, a, like crazy. But again, the 1930s, they had to start demonizing the root workers. They started throwing this whole thing where you gotta have a license, and then they start putting out these zombie movies and all that. You see niggas doing that, oh, they're into the devil. Even now, we got people in here, well, that's, that's evil. That's white propaganda. Who do is not evil. Hoodoo was never evil. Now, you can tap into some, some spirits of revenge with it. Yeah, you can tap into that. Just revenge. Revenge that, that is just. Yeah. But, um, who is this texting me? A lot of people texting me. Um, okay, hold on. Okay. Coming very rooster. Sorry, guys. People, a lot of people are texting me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were getting boils from the bad deodorant. Yeah, man, I would, I would get these painful lumps under my arms. And what the hell? I said, man, let me, let me stop putting these petrochemicals under my damn arm. Yeah. But man, but the root work is real. And look, our grandparents. Let's be real, man. Our, our grandparents were doing forms of root work. If you got one of them old school grandparents or had old school grandparents. They knew how to get out there and, and, and make certain things that would heal you. They knew how to put things together, roots and herbs together. They knew how to do this stuff. They knew how to get it popping. Our people knew how to get out there in the grass and get out there in the gardens and make things happen and heal the people. Yeah? Yeah, that you get the lumps from them chemicals, man. Yeah, you get them lumps now. If you live, I'm seeing a lot of y'all getting them lumps under your arm. Change your deodorant game, man. Get get the root work package. Get the root work package, man. Um, you get the your choice of the deodorant, man. It's great. This smells phenomenal too. Get the um, the coconut butter and the pure vanilla, man. We got different smells. Very very good in the package. You get the the root work towel. You're gonna get the mysteries of the root book. That gives you an introduction to root work, our culture. You understand? And you're gonna get the American Maroon Blu-ray and the Buck Breaking Blu-ray. You're gonna get all of that stuff in the package. Get that now. You guys are going to love it. This is a great introductory package at rootworkstyle.com. Rootworkstyle.com. Yes, it's aluminum free. So you're not gonna get no lumps under your arms. You dig? So get that right now. No, this is a roll-on. This is roll-on. This is the roll-on deodorant. And this one has Hi John the Conqueror root in it. All right, which I can see that. This one has, let me show you the ingredients. Where we at? 
where are the ingredients, where are my ingredients, the writing is small here, uh, where we at, we have, where we at, Hi John the Conqueror root is in it, so this has some of the root work that our families were using, we have the Hi John the Conqueror root in this ladies and gentlemen. This is actually the first foundational black American themed deodorant. We think everything is exotic. We think all of these things from all of these other cultures is exotic. No, the exotic history is our history, dude. Our culture is interesting enough. Family, we got to understand how interesting our culture is. Our culture is extremely interesting. It ain't. Is the stream lagging? So look, we, we're tapping back into our culture. Oh yeah, the, the link, where's the link? The link is below in the, the comment section. If you go to the comment section, go to rootworkstyle.com. Rootworkstyle.com. Yes, this is unisex, man. This is a unisex deodorant. It's for men and women. It's a unisex smell. See, vanilla and coconut butter. Not cocoa butter, coconut butter. See, those are unisex scents. See, men and women, like if you put on cocoa butter men, or, or uh, vanilla, men and women can wear a vanilla smell uh, or coconut butter smell. Yeah? Your mother, your grandmother would make different elixirs. Yeah, our grandparents knew. Our grandparents knew how to put this stuff together. Our history is very exotic. And our history is very exotic. And High John the Conqueror root, that's a root that is based on the foundation of black American enslaved brother. And the, the rumor was, or the, the narrative was, he was um, a brother who was a trickster, who was a fighter, and he said, when I leave the plantation, when I leave, when I transition, my spirit is going to go to Africa. I'm going to leave my spirit here in the root for you, in this particular root. If you ever need me, go to this root, and my spirit is going to be there. A lot of stuff as far as luck and things like that comes from foundational black American hoodoo culture. The whole thing about carrying a lucky rabbit's foot, that came from foundational black American hoodoo culture. The lucky rabbit's foot, because that was one thing that we would do. We popularized that. They try to say it may have come from Europe. No, it got popular with us. We popularized the lucky rabbit's foot. That was a hoodoo thing. Look that up. That was the foundational black American hoodoo tactic. Why did we look at the rabbit's foot as something, as something that we need to carry? Allegorically, black people who were enslaved, we saw ourselves allegorically like the rabbit. That's why there were so many Br'er Rabbit narratives concerning black people who were enslaved. The whole Br'er Rabbit thing, the trickster. Black people saw ourselves like the rabbit. The rabbit was very vulnerable because the rabbit is an animal of that's being preyed upon. The rabbit is an animal that's vulnerable and is constantly being preyed upon. And the rabbit, we saw that the rabbit has to come up with very clever ways in order to escape danger. They have to be fast, they have to think on their feet, they have to eat a certain way, they have to manipulate the surroundings. So we saw ourselves in our situation um, in the rabbit. So we would come up with these Br'er Rabbit narratives of the rabbit that was a trickster, the rabbit who would encounter wolves and all of these other dangerous, violent animals, and we would have to come up with these ways to manipulate our way out of the situation. Bugs Bunny is based on the Br'er Rabbit narrative. That's what Bugs Bunny is always this smart aleck smart -aleck rabbit who can con himself or con his way or, or trick his way out of certain situations. That's based on the Br'er Rabbit narrative. And if you look at Br'er Rabbit, um, Disney, when you look at their version of Br'er Rabbit, they got a bunch of slaves around. You dig? The Br'er Rabbit cartoons from Disney is based on foundation of black American slavery. You know? So we use a lot of rabbit allegories in a lot of our stories. So we had to have a lot of wit. We had to learn how to have, we, in our vulnerable stage, we have to be um, charismatic. We had to learn how to be cool when we needed to be. We had to learn how to really control our emotions and think quickly on our feet. 
have some game. That's where the game thing comes from. You got to be kind of street smart. Yeah, I talked about that. And look at the allegory. And I talked about this the other day. Remember the movie um, Us? Like I said, the movie Us was an allegory about immigration. The, even the title, Us, can be looked at as United States, U.S. So what was the whole theme of the movie Us? It was about a black family who was living a normal life, and then you had these people living underground who wanted to come up and replace them, who wanted to tether off them. That's why we use the term tether. It's about these people who've been living underground, trying to find their way above ground across the border to come and replace those black people who were living here. And when they were living underground, notice they were eating raw rabbits. They were eating rabbits. They were living off rabbits. Look at the allegory to that. And remember, enslaved black people looked at ourselves as rabbits. We looked at ourselves allegorically as rabbits. Now look at them. They're living underground, eating the rabbits that are symbolic of the slaves. All right? They're eating the... They're ingesting the slave legacy so that they can get above ground and tether off the people whose lineages come from here. That's a very interesting allegory, man. That's a, that was a very interesting allegory. Yeah? Think about that. This shit gets heavy, don't it? But rabbits have always, we've always during slavery had rabbit allegories for us. We looked at ourselves through the lens of rabbits. Uh -huh. Yeah, the rabbit part kind of went over people's heads. But yeah, we've always viewed ourselves in the eyes of the rabbits. We're like the rabbits. We're in this vulnerable position, so we got to think quick on our feet. We got to manipulate and we got to duck and dodge danger all the time. So we got to be witty, quick witted. We got to carry that rabbit's foot with us as good luck, as part of the hoodoo ritual. Real heavy game, man. Real heavy game. This is real heavy stuff. But yeah, man, I, we, we got to really start embracing our culture and teaching our culture. Because one thing I kept seeing when I'm studying our history, I keep seeing this thing about us dealing with these herbs. That just keeps popping up. And whenever I see something pop up and I see that it's being hidden, I said, okay, why did... Why are they hiding this stuff? Because that's one thing they never talk about. They never talk about how we were root workers and how we were using these roots and herbs to heal ourselves, to bring certain energy, to get vengeance. They don't want us tapping back into that. They don't want us tapping back to, into that energy because we get a lot of strength from that. That's why they like keeping us in urban areas. You dig? They like funneling us into these urban areas getting us away from land, grass, trees. You dig? Know? Because when we got land, grass, trees, we can start tapping back into a lot of stuff. That's why they, when y'all see black farmers, look at how they treat black farmers. They're always trying to run a black farmer off his land. Whenever we start getting farms again, notice that? When we start getting back on some farmland, all of a sudden the white supremacists are trying to burn our shit down. The white supremacists and the cops are trying to run us up out of town like they did the black family in Colorado. They got farmland and they're trying to run them out of town. They don't want us tapping back into that farmland, getting around them trees and getting in the grass and the dirt and us getting back with them roots no more. They don't want that. They no, Stay in the urban area. Let's build a nice project for you, nigga. Let's build you a nice project. Yeah. They like us stuck in an urban area, dude. We can't get the energy that we need in these urban areas. We gotta be able to tap into nature. We gotta be able to tap back in. That's why, going back early, what I was talking about grass and energy. There's a reason why, man, when you go to a housing project, the energy isn't right. Because you're not supposed to be stacked up on top of each other, cooped up. You're not supposed to be like that. That's why you look at a housing project, look at the grass. There's never good grass in a housing project. Notice that? Because the energy is off. You go to any housing project, the grass is always spotty and patchy. The grass is never fluid. The, the grass never grows like it's supposed to because the energy isn't correct. That's not the right energy. Yeah? 
They don't want us tapping back into that agrarian society, that agrarian culture, getting our hands in that dirt, getting our hands in that grass. Yeah? If we start tapping back into them real energies, yeah, a bunch of concrete. All right. Yeah. See, they don't want us dealing with, they don't want us living near nature and they don't want us living near no water. All right. They price us out of water. They understand how important the grass and the water is. They understand, listen, family, when we get around some grass and some water and our energy start tapping in, family, there's a reason why Lake Lanier that you know what it is in Lake Lanier. They know what our energy is like with Lake Lanier. They see what the energy is. Again, water, trees, all of that, there's energy in that stuff. That's why Lake Lanier keeps claiming lives. Lake Lanier gets revenge. They understand that when we start tapping back into nature and water, that's a problem. There's a reason why, and I always talk about the swamps. Remember, when you talk about the Great Dismal Swamp, you're dealing with large bodies of water in there, and they said, that water had different powers and energy. Also, you're dealing with a bunch of root workers. In the Great Dismal Swamp, those black maroons who were in the swamp, you better understand, many of them were trading with people on the plantations covertly. They would say, hey, bring me some guns from the plantation. I will give you some herbs. I give you some of the roots you need for some of the rituals you need to do. So there was trade going on in the Great Dismal Swamp. So understand, you had these black maroons living in the swamp, the Great Dismal Swamp in particular. And there's a bunch of root workers and hoodoo people in there tapping into that water energy, the root energy. There was a reason why white people couldn't go in there. It was too many people in there with power. That water and them roots were too powerful. We were too tapped in. Even some of the people who went in there, they said, hey, it seemed like the black people there were, were blending in with the, the, the trees and the bushes. It seemed like the black people just blended in with the swamp. I didn't even see them. You go in that swamp and you weren't supposed to be in there. You don't even know what hit you. You didn't even see what hit you. And that swamp, that's the only place that never took an L. The Great Dismal Swamp. You had a bunch of people in there practicing root work. They were tapped in. The energy was protecting them. They were healing themselves. They were saying some of the healthiest people were coming out of that swamp because they had that water that was very healthy and they had them roots that were very healthy. And those brothers and sisters were not no joke and they were extremely healthy and the roots and the herbs and the water was very prized. They're, they're doing research in the Great Dismal Swamp now learning about what happened in the swamp and they don't tell us about that. They got scientists that set up shop in the Great Dismal Swamp now studying every nook and cranny of it. Yeah? Yeah. The white people couldn't go in that swamp. You walk off in there, that was your last time going in there. That nobody, if you went in there, you never made it out. If you went in certain parts of that swamp, you never made it out. Yeah? Those folks were tapped into nature heavy. They don't want us to be like that. They don't want us to be around no nature and no water. And so understand, understand our history, man. These folks know what we are. They know who we are. They know what we're, we're capable of. Oh yeah, yeah, we live with crocodiles, snakes, bears, and, and we're tapped in and weren't getting harmed. We were tapped in with the swamp. They're studying that to this day. They're studying that to this day. They're like, these Negroes are something else. We were tapped into nature, dude. We were tapped into that root work. Dude, our history is amazing as foundation of black Americans. And that's why when it comes to teaching history, they don't mind you teaching African history. See, they don't mind us skipping over our history and talking about Africa. They don't mind that. If we're talking about ancient Africa and ancient Egypt and ancient Ghana, they have zero problem with that. Oh, they're like, hell, nigga, here's $2 billion. Go have an African studies course at the school. Knock yourself out, Negro. They have no problem with that. Am I lagging here? <clears throat> Look like I'm lagging a little bit. But yeah, they have no problem with us teaching African studies. There's a lot of people in here. 
If I'm lagging, forgive me. I might be lagging. You know, sometimes at these hotels, the reception is kind of janky. But yeah, they have no problem with us um, teaching African history. They ain't got no problem with it. I'm not lagging, I'm good, okay, I'm good, okay. It looks like I'm lagging a little bit, but I'm good. Lagging a little, okay, but y'all feel what I'm saying. There's a lot of folks in here, damn near 5,000 people in here. But listen, yeah, if we're talking about African history, we wanna talk about ancient Kemet and ancient Zimbabwe and all of that stuff, oh, Negro, knock yourself out. Go put on a kente cloth, we'll give you a budget, teach about all that African history. Notice, family, when we start focusing on foundational black American history, right when we say, well, you know what, wait a minute, wait a minute, African, African history is cool, let's uncover all the stuff here. Let's uncover all the stuff that's not being talked about here on this soil, because that's what's not being talked about. All of these black inventors, all of these black freedom fighters, all of these black people who were doctors and root workers and medical, let's tap into that. When we start tapping into foundational black American history, all of a sudden, oh, uh, critical race theory, we can't teach that now. Oh, we can't teach that critical race theory. Uh, uh, we can't teach it in Florida now. We're gonna take all these books out. We can't talk about slavery now. That's gonna make the white kids feel bad. Oh, y'all talking about slavery, oh. We can't make the white feel, the white kids gonna feel bad. No, 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 that's not what it is. It's not about the white kids feeling bad. It's about the black kids getting empowered. We don't want you niggas teaching each other this stuff because y'all gonna start getting empowered. Y'all gonna start learning about the black folks who fought back. Y'all gonna start learning about the black folks who weren't taking this shit that we were doing. Oh, no, 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 we gotta get that out the schools, you see? That's what they don't want you to learn about. They don't want you to learn about the riders. They don't want you to learn about these root workers who had a root in their pocket and went and whooped some white supremacist's ass. They don't want you to know that. They don't want you to know about these brothers and sisters who put a concoction together, rubbed it on their body and start slicing and dicing. They don't want you to know that. That's what they don't want you to know. <laughs> yeah. No, come on, John Lewis, we got a statue of John Lewis now. Let's. You know, take John Lewis took an ass whooping like a soldier. Now let's talk about John Lewis. Yeah. But yeah, Nat Turner, he was doing root work and hoodoo. That's why they ate him. They were eating Nat Turner. They got his body and chopped it up and made oil and putting his body parts in food. They were ingesting Nat Turner. You know? Get the book, the delectable Negro. There's a reason why these people were eating us. Get the book, The Delectable Negro, and even um, the, the movie um, Hidden Colors 5, I think we talked about that, how these white supremacists were sitting up here eating on us. It wasn't just Jeffrey Dahmer, all right? It wasn't just Jeffrey Dahmer. He's the only one who, he just got caught. You think Jeffrey Dahmer was the only one sitting up here snacking on us like damn sunflower seeds? Just eating black folks left? No, he wasn't the only one. They've been doing that stuff, ingesting us, trying to get our power. Yeah. There's, there's a bunch of Jeffrey Dahmer's out there, dude. He was the only one who got caught. But look, the root work package is a phenomenal package, man. Um, again, the deodorant has a book that comes along with it. Mysteries of the Root. It gives you an introduction to foundational black American root work and hoodoo. Real easy read. It's a great compliment to the, the deodorant. You're gonna love the deodorant, man. Root work comes in the root work box. Again, got the hand towel, the different scents of um, deodorant. Real good stuff. You're going to love the scent, ladies and gentlemen. Infused with some ancestral spirits from foundational Black American culture. Go to rootworkstyle.com. Rootworkstyle.com, ladies and gentlemen. That's where you can go. To get that, let me show you the website one more time, ladies and gentlemen. It is rootworkstyle.com, and the package is for a limited time only. This is a promotional package. This is to introduce you to it, get you hip to it, to let you love on it. This is the website right here, rootwork, 
all natural deodorant, ladies and gentlemen. Oh so yeah, going up, boom, boom, boom. Mystery of the root. That's the book that's going to come with the package. All right, this deodorant here. Beautiful website, great cologne. Check it out, rootworkstyle.com. Rootworkstyle.com. Get yours right now, ladies and gentlemen. All right. What's up? You got email me, man. If you're a taxi driver in New York, email me. What what's some good late night? I, I forgot it's it's late out here in New York. What's some good late night eating spots in New York? A lot of stuff close early, surprisingly. A lot of the, the soul food spots close early. What's a good late night eating spot out here in New York? I forgot. I'm still on LA time and I it, it's late as hell. But rootworkstyle.com. Everybody go to rootworkstyle.com. Get your package right now, man. You guys, you guys are gonna love it. This is the part of your culture. And if you're not FBA, enjoy it. You can get it and learn about FBA culture and get some of this fresh FBA scent. You're gonna love it too. You're gonna love it too. Rootworkstyle.com. And if you see some musty niggas, say, hey, you you need some of this root work. If you see if you could work with some niggas who are musty. Get the package for them and just leave it on the desk. You know, just if you see somebody musty at your job, get them, get them this, help them out. This would be a nice um, potluck gift for somebody musty at your job. Get them some of this. Get some of this great deodorant with great energy, ladies and gentlemen. Great deodorant with great energy. All right, let me get up out of here, guys. It's been real. Oh, yeah. Um, Come to the Hidden History Museum, man. August 12th. We got a rap contest um, at the Hidden History Museum. Um, comedy show. Nice little turn up, man. Y'all come on through August 12th. Get your tickets. Um, HiddenHistoryMuseum.com. HiddenHistoryMuseum.com, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm going to holler at you guys. Papiakute and Lala Vuve to the family, ladies and gentlemen. I'm out.